Hi, uh, my name is Colin. I'm a master's student here at Karma. Uh, and together with Nick Krug and um, Dan Douglas, we made a uh, new musical instrument called the Lattice Harp, which uh, sort of challenges the, um, the separation of uh, control data and audio data. So uh, where do we come up with this idea? Um, the inspiration was basically that uh, musical hardware controllers like this uh, MPC-2000 are, um, are normally consists of a bunch of buttons and knobs, and uh, those aren't um, things that we normally associate with uh, the creation of music. And when you think of someone playing music, you think of them playing a, a guitar or you know, a, a violin or a trombone. Um, whereas with buttons, buttons are just generally to control things. They're not necessarily to make music. Um, and so we wanted to create something that was a controller, but was also um, played into sort of people's uh, preconceived and really hard creating notion that uh, one should, when making music, one should play a musical instrument. Um, and so when thinking about how to do this, we sort of thought about uh, the, the harp and uh, the hammer dulcimer, and sort of thought, well, what if we take um, two, or one, what if we take this single dimension of strings and put a second dimension underneath it? And then when the strings touch, we can treat that as a button press. Or similarly, when two strings are vibrating, you can treat that as a button press. Um, and uh, sort of the idea, of uh, two-dimensional lattices is uh, also something that sort of plays into uh, people's uh, emotions. Uh, we see them all over the place, like architecturally and in, um, in trellises like this. Um, and also uh, in music and modular synthesizers, you sometimes see uh, pin-based, patch-based um, for controlling modular synthesizers. Um, and But other than that, the idea of two-dimensional strings really hasn't been explored much in music. So. Um, so when thinking about how we're going to build this, we sort of came up with a number of, uh, of goals or uh, milestones or design components. Um, I guess the first one was just to make an instrument that made sound, like it's just a, a simple, sim quite simply an acoustic instrument. Um, from there we could extend it to an electric instrument, much like going from a guitar to an electric guitar um, by putting pickups, uh, and as, as we did, we put one pickup per string. So we have 16 strings, or actually 16 pickups. Um, and uh, from there, we can sort of set it up as a button controller, um, using a microcontroller to detect when two strings are connected, and then sending messages uh, to the computer. Um, and then finally, sort of the last uh, goal was to make like a actually 16 channel analog controller using that, using the pickup output as actual analog control um, to control one, one parameter or another. Um, and sort of the really important thing is not so much these four discrete goals, but it's the interplay of, um, of all of these things. Uh, it's sort of like the idea of uh, you have a piano, but uh, you can, um, it's sort of like the idea of piano to prepare piano. Because you have control over the insides and you can, you can put things in the, between the strings, make bizarre things happen, um, and we're going to demonstrate some of the interesting features and uh, um, sort of unexpected stuff in just a little bit. So, so for the construction of this prototype, well, we, we wanted to first make sure, obviously, that we had a very nice, rigid frame um, that wasn't going to buckle under the tension of all these strings you know, in either axis. So we ended up finding a, a bamboo cutting board that worked, worked really nicely, both visually and it's, you know, it's extremely sturdy, so that works out really well. Um, on, the tun uh, on our pegs for the string matrix, we, on the tunable side, we used the same pins that you'd find in a piano and this, this wrench to tune them. And then on the uh, stationary side, we have zither pins to uh, just, you know, to, to keep everything fastened down. For our bridges, we used maple, uh, some thin ply maple that we've doubled up and then um, actually sandwiched our piezos for each string in between, um, in between our pieces of maple here. So then, the, um, for, as far as the button presses, when we, out of our microcontroller, we, we set the five volts into each string through the, you can't see the wires, but it goes through the body and um, out, the, out the bottom. And so basically, we're just using um, us, uh, the, uh, the, the data uh, through our microcontroller to um, get where these button presses happen, which um, Colin's going to bring up a, uh, yeah. a little display there. You can see um, kind of where, where they happen. We're going we're gonna to take you through some of the functionality here, um, starting with just an acoustic instrument without any amplification at all, which is going to be quiet. But the tuning that we've that we've gone for, obviously, you can do any tuning. Uh, is B major with um, on the 
a, a diatonic E major Ionian scale on the top, and um, then some extensions on the lower on the lower axis of strings. So if we could get the sound up now. Yeah, just just to uh, keep you in touch with what's what's being visualized. Um, the the top window there is showing the output from the piezos and that sort of. Uh, this matrix right here, an X corresponds to somewhere where two strings are vibrating. Uh, uh, it's just sort of a different way to visualize it. Uh, and down here, that's where the presses are happening. So as you can hear right now, we have um, the strings panned throughout the room in a circular fashion. And this is uh, just one really simple effect of having so many pieces so that we can circularly pan the sound. Uh, and it creates a very inter interesting spatial environment. Because this is a string instrument, we can use uh, devices that are intended for other string instruments pretty much immediately. Um, one example is the Evo, which is uh, commonly used with electric guitars to just cause strings to vibrate on their own. Unfortunately, we can't use like a violin bow with um, with uh, the lattice harp because it doesn't really fit between the strings. But by using something like the Evo, we can definitely um, we can get a similar effect. Um, we also uh, can use other things to both, such as uh, just literally a file. Um, and files give a much more rough sound than a violin, for example, but nevertheless, it's still quite an interesting sound. Um, so in terms of the press data, we found that the, the most reliable way to get like a, dis a discrete, obvious button press is by using banjo picks, um, just metal picks connected to your fingers. And in that way, when you touch two strings together, you get a button press, a single button press. And in this way, it's basically as, um, as functional as a standard button controller. Um, and I'm going to turn on a, syn a simple synthesizer just to sort of uh, give you uh, audio for the button presses. So whenever Nick presses a uh, button together, a, a different note sounds. Um, and right now you see he's pushing down multiple um, multiple buttons, um, and thus you hear sort of this chord. Um, one really uh, sort of expressive and nice uh, way to use this for button press data is, as Nick's doing now, by pushing down on the strings. Um, and one, one side effect of that is that if you push down gently, you can get one press, but as you push down harder, the string touches more and more of the strings underneath it, and you get these sort of columns. And especially right now, when we have a set of control of synth, you get chords rather than single notes. Um, and it's, it's, sort of, it's really satisfying to push down slowly and have it expand into a chord as you press. Um, and uh, sort of in, in, uh, in light of a, a prepared piano, one thing you can do uh, in just in the most simple way, it's literally just drop things on it. Um, so, right, Nick's going to drop some washers on it, and because they're made of metal, first you get this sort of tingling sound, and then as they rest, you get a um, you get the the chords start, starting to play. So, so if he drops like a bunch all at once, you get a sort of a tingling sound. The and chord all through, and they all pull through. Yeah. Um, so one side effect of uh, not having direct control of the individual locations on the button matrix is that we get ghosting. And ghosting is uh, essentially an effect in, in button pads where if you push this button and this button and this button, this button turns on. And you may have noticed it if you were really astute in watching that press down and button. So right now what Dick's doing is he's pressing a row and a column and you see we're starting to get a square rather than just like like this. You can get all of those starting to fill in. And really, I mean, in, in the case of a button pad, you don't want that to happen. That's not, you don't want your user to be pressing a button that they're not pressing, so to speak. But in this case, um, it's actually just another interesting way to get even bigger chords, for example. Um, and uh, finally, just because of the form factor of it, uh, it can be played from both sides. Nick right now is playing it as a tabletop instrument, but if you put it up on its side, it can easily be played just like a standard harp um, with both hands, uh, which is a little hard to do with so many cables connected to it, but you know, you can start either way. So.